God sent his son They called him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He lived and died To buy my grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know the future and life is worth the living just because he lives how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives. And then one day I'll cross the river, I'll fight life's final war. With pain, and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know He lives because He lives. I can face tomorrow Because he lives All fear is gone Because I know He holds the future And life is worth the living just because he lives Because he lives I could face tomorrow Because he lives All fear is gone Because I know He holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen. Amen. That was beautiful because he lives. Amen. Thank you, Dana. Well, let's bow ahead and, and ask God's presence to be with us as we um, invite. Dr. Jeff, to come up and share the word of God with us. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, Lord, there are no truer words than what was just sung, that because, Jesus, you live, we can face tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus, for um, being willing, because you had a choice also, to come, Lord, and, and to take upon yourself, Lord, the guilt, the shame, Lord, and the sin of humanity. 
And because of that, Lord, today we can rejoice. Because of that, Lord, we have a hope and we have a future. And Lord, we're just so grateful. Tonight, Lord, I pray in a special way that your Holy Spirit will just come and consume our hearts and our minds. That your very presence would be here. That your angels would be here with us. Not only with us here, but with those who are watching on live stream, Lord, that, that your presence and your spirit will be with them. Lord, we want to learn about what happened on that cross. We want to learn the cost of our salvation. We want to be able, Lord, to be able to love you with all our heart, mind, and soul. So bless Jeff this evening, Lord, as he opens your word. Anoint him with your Holy Spirit. Lord, let it be your voice speaking through him, Lord. And we're just so grateful that for the opportunity to be here and on this special week to reflect on the goodness of God and the sacrifice of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Well, good evening, folks. Good evening. It's good to see you again. Your faces are beginning to look familiar to me. Um, I went home today and uh, there was a house full of people. Apparently my wife heard the sermon. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, there was a lot of people there and uh, we had kind of a traditional meal. You might have eaten it before. It's called uh, Haystacks, right? It's where you get the beans and all that kind of stuff. Haystack is like a, it's like a taco salad, you know, with beans type of thing. And uh, and uh, it brought to my memory. I I've been all over the world and doing this sort of stuff. And uh, I was in the Netherlands one time. And usually with a haystack, you have like some sort of salsa, you know, to put on it to kind of give it that hot, a little bit of heat thing. And, uh, and in the Netherlands, I was sitting down, I was saying, oh, this is great, you know, it's gonna feel like home. Instead of, instead of salsa, they brought out ketchup. <laughs> and I just thought to myself, do I have to do this? <laughs> right? And uh, I, I did because of a lesson I learned when I was real young, when I was 20 years old, I was a missionary. And I was a missionary in Haiti. Very, very poor country. Uh, and uh, I went out with uh, one of the older missionaries. We went on a missionary journey out into the boondocks, and somebody, uh, some family put us up overnight. And we got up the next morning, and there was this beautiful breakfast made uh, with, you know, rice and eggs and some sort of mystery thing inside of it, right? And she saw me. The, the missionary lady saw me. She saw, she saw me. The you know my the screws started going on in my head because I usually try not to eat what I don't know what it is, especially in Haiti, uh, because uh, in Haiti in the market um, uh, they were selling something called long pig. Uh, long pig is human meat, and so I really didn't want anything to do with that. But she looked over at me. She said, "This is a missionary." She said. Just shut up and eat it. <laughs> and that's because if we didn't, they had, these people were so poor that this was a luxury that they were giving to us. And if they didn't, if we didn't eat it, we would have lost our opportunity to be able to witness to them. And so I just figured God can turn it into anything he wants in that moment. For all I knew, it was, you know, a piece of apple or something like that. But it didn't kill me, and we were, we were able to witness to those people. And so I ate the ketchup on my taco salad. <laughs> and I've eaten certain things I like to eat everywhere I go. I like to try pizza everywhere I go in the world. And I've had some really strange pizzas as well. Um, again, sometimes with uh, one place was ketchup and goat cheese, and um, that was interesting. <laughs> I think that was in Peru. Okay, so.
tonight. First off, I want, to, uh, want you to know that we're planning something on Tuesday. Uh, and what I'd like to do with you is because I've seen some of you are limping around and some of you uh, aren't feeling so great. And even I'm not feeling great uh, these days. I'm still recovering from all the time I spent a week. I spent five days in a row uh, not sleeping as my mom was uh, passing away. And you don't recover from that too quickly, if you know what I mean. And when I was young, I could stay up all night get up, take a test, and you know, go play tennis or something. Now I can't do that anymore. I don't know about you, but what I'd like to do is for us to have a time of healing on uh, Tuesday night, and we can just uh, anoint people who would like to be anointed. Uh, and when I talk about healing, I'm not just talking about physical healing. As some, some of us are broken inside in other ways. I would like to pray, over, pray about that and and, uh, and, and anoint you as well. I'll read it to you uh, from the book of James, if you want to turn there. The book of James. And chapter 5. And we'll be, I'll start reading at verse 13. I just want you to understand what we're trying to, to do. So, so far I said brokenness. I said uh, if you're having a physical ailment. Um, and, and I would include in this if you feel like you're double-minded. Um, this is specifically for that. And, you, and remember I defined double-mindedness as you feel like you got a foot in the world and you're trying to get a foot with Jesus, right? You're trying to do balance both of those, and, and Christ has called us to be in him, okay? So if you feel like that's your condition, this uh, time will be appropriate to you too, okay? Listen to what it says here in 5 verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms or psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And uh, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, this, is, this is not something that we should just do once in a while. It's something we should do all the time, right? We just uh, kind of uh, lack the faith a little bit to practice these things because um, we think that God can only answer prayers the way we think he can answer them, right? You understand what I'm saying? Uh, in other words, if we pray, I've prayed over a lot of people, anointed them with oil, even my mother, you know? And uh, if you pray for the will of God to be done, then you're accepting as to how that goes, right? Because one of the things with my mom passing is I learned a new lesson, as I sat there and, 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 and she was dying and I was getting, you know, I was getting upset with God, I learned that I'm not ready for the time of trouble. I'm not ready for the time. Much worse things are coming. I want Jesus to prepare my heart for the times that are coming. And so it was a hard lesson for me to learn, especially because it was my mom, you know. Uh, but uh, I'm thankful to, to God that I... He gave me the opportunity to go through that, and my mom is now sleeping in Jesus. You know, he's faithful. So uh, we're going to have a card that we're giving out tonight for various types of commitments. It looks like this. I don't know if you got one, but we're going to pass them out. And uh, I'll tell you which numbers are which when we get to that at, at the end of the show. Don't, at, at the end of the show. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm not going to dance, I'm not going to sing, nothing like that, but at the end of the evening, <laughs> you wouldn't want it. <laughs> We're going to have a various commitment levels of things, and I need you that one of them is going to be that uh, you'd like to participate in that service. Uh, I think we'll do it after uh, the meeting, okay, that night. And we'll just stay by, and um, we're going to pray for each other, we're going to lay hands on each other, and... You know, I'm going to sign up and you can pray for me and lay hands on me as well. Is that okay? Are you willing to do that for me? Amen. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So um, 
If I were a pastor in a church, I would be practicing this several times a month. Because I just read it to you out of the Bible, right? And, uh, and so uh, we, we, we won't see great miracles happen until we practice asking for great miracles, Amen. right? And in this day and age, right, because the way I read the Bible, I understand that we should have the expectation of the Holy Spirit to do marvelous things. It's not the same anymore. It's not the same. The time is coming when the sick will be healed again, just like when Jesus was healed. That's coming. And so we in faith have to move forward. This isn't uh, something I'm making up. It's, it's uh, clearly given to us in the scriptures. I'm not presumptuous, just so you know. I'm not presuming on God. I'm just asking you along with me to put ourselves in a position where God can do marvelous things, right? Okay. Tonight, uh, we're going to do something. You're going to have to put your theological caps on a little bit because I've been easy on you so far. <laughs> okay, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna dive a little bit deeper. If you have that piece of paper that was in the bulletin or a piece of paper, this would be a good night to take notes so that uh, if you don't have a piece of paper, use the, somebody needs to get paper for everybody uh, so that uh, you can take this uh, uh, back. Now, now this, um, what I'm going to present tonight is uh, what I call is the truth that saves, okay? In other words, there's lots of truths, there's lots of things to learn in the Bible, but this is the truth that saves you. And so, um, if, if you were um, Satan, uh, and I'm not saying you are, maybe some of you, I don't know, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, if you were Satan, if there's one truth that saves, which one would you attack? You'd attack the one that saves, okay? So you, I'm, I hope I'm piquing your interest here as to what that truth is. We're going to look at it a little bit more theologically, uh, and so that you can say, oh, yeah, I get that. That makes sense in, in light of what we're doing this week, okay? Because the Bible teaches us that from the foundations of the world, God made a plan. He made a plan. Oh, by the way, that's before anybody was created. God made a plan called the plan of redemption or the plan to save us. Now, God is the only one that could do that because God isn't subject to time or space, right? In other words, he sees the past, the present, and the future at the same time. It's hard to understand that conceptually. But it's, a, it's sort of like uh, thinking about outer space, right? Uh, I, when I was a kid, I used to think to myself, I would like to be an astronaut, and I used to wonder how far I could go in that direction before I couldn't go anymore. And what's the answer to that? It's endless. It goes forever and ever, and then my mind would be like, you know, how much can a seven-year-old take, <laughs> right? How much can I take? How can, I, how can it be forever? But that's the mind of God, isn't it? It's how God is, is he, he lives in time. Now, now I want you, what I want you to understand then is that if that's the case, then God relives the crucifixion over and over again in his mind. Are you, you, you with me? In other words, G e, the, the, the whole sacrificial process of Jesus and the whole story and the history of man, that, actually it's just a blip on the line of eternity, but God relives that experience as if it's the first time because he's not subject to space or time. Okay? That's all the physics I know. Okay? But I want you to contemplate that a little bit and think about it. Um, and so we, when it said, the Bible teaches us that God, before there was a human even created, uh, already was working on a plan to save us 
We can understand that in the light of that character of God, right? It's because he looked ahead. He said, these are the things that are going to happen. Now, what does that tell you about God that he would do that? It should be something that we've talked about already. God loves us, right? In fact, he loved us before we were created. Because it would have been a whole lot easier if he looked at what was coming and he just said, oh, we're not going to do that whole thing. And because he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful, almighty, he could have just said, okay, we're, this is it. We're not going down that road. And I'm just going to erase everybody's mind in the universe. They'll never know. But God is so true to who he is and what he is that he couldn't take that approach to things because he looked down through history and he saw you there. And he said, I love you so much, we're going to go through all of this. Not just for you, but for the whole universe. That's some amazing love, isn't it? Would have been a lot easier for God the other way, except because of who he is, he, it wasn't possible for him to do that. And so everything revolves around the foundation that we've established here, and that is that God is love and he loves us dearly, more than we can imagine. You know, people in, in the Bible have been, uh, the, uh, like Cyrus, God talks about them before they were even born by name. And God knew you by name before you were born and had a purpose drawn up for you in his kingdom. Can you say amen? amen? Do you know that you have a purpose in the kingdom of heaven? Yeah, every one of you, God has purposed. And he knows you by name, and he knows exactly what he wants you to do. In fact, the Bible says when a, a church is being put together, and this is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when a church is put together, that God puts the people into the body. In other words, you, you're not here because, just simply because you made a choice, it's because God impressed you inside your heart, inside your mind, that you needed to be part of this very specific place. That is so cool. That God knew that you people needed to be together, be together at the same time. And it works best, according to God, is as you realize that, that he's gifted you all in different ways so that when everybody, through the Holy Spirit, receives their gift, they work together and there's this perfect harmony that reveals who he is. Amen? Amen. Now, what happens if you don't bring your gift to the table? You can lose it, but it can also be an incomplete picture of God, can it? Because God's intention is for everybody to bring their gift. And some of you are saying, oh, I, I don't know, if, I can't sing. I can't play a, a musical instrument. I can't preach. I can't give a Bible study. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. That's irrelevant because uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us that God, the Holy Spirit, has come to God's people, you, and everyone has been given a spiritual gift. Amen? Amen? At least one, maybe, maybe five or six. Some people have lots of them that they bring <laughs> to the table. But what the scripture says is that the ones that we think are the least important become the very important ones. Amen. Right? You know, you, you might think that you don't need your little toe. But did you know that if you lose your little toe, that you lose your balance? And the whole body suffers? How about that? And so, you know, sometimes you should explore spiritual gifts together and see what, brought, what God has brought together here in Pottsville and, uh, and to see what he wants to do with that. Amen? Okay, so you can do that sometime. Sometime I'll preach a sermon on that for you. Uh, and you'll be very excited about what God has brought. But in the fullness of time, God looked ahead in that time. And he said, I need to 
create a plan that solves the problem of sin, right? Because uh, we know that uh, the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what does that mean if we put those two together? That all have sinned and deserve death. Okay? That's talking about you and me. Talking about the whole world, right? We, the whole world has found itself in sin, and so the penalty or the, the thing that hangs over us is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Now, God had to figure out, how do I get them from death to life? So he and Jesus and the Holy Spirit got together, and they began to formulate a plan. And the plan they decided on is Jesus volunteered to be here on earth. The Father uh, volunteered in a different capacity, and the Holy Spirit volunteered in a different capacity. If you want to see what those, those are, let's turn to 1 Corinthians in your Bibles. I'll just briefly, 1 Corinthians You know, when, when I have my Bible, I don't have to use these little tabby things. 1 Corinthians and chapter 12. This chapter is about spiritual gifts, and um, it, it tells us, uh, first off, we can read a place here right in the beginning that tells us that the gifts come from the Holy Spirit. That's in verse 4. There are diversity of gifts, but same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. Okay, what I want you to see here is, is that all three of those, the, the Trinity, are mentioned. <laughs> That it says, therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by, by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus, the Lord, except through the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but the same God. You see, if you were talking about an organization, you would say, okay, well, the Holy Spirit's in charge of the gifts, the Lord is in charge of the differences of ministries, and God is in charge of of the diversity of activities. You see that? It's the one place in the Bible that shows that they're distinctly involved in certain aspects of their interaction with us, right? So that happens, right? You know, uh, Christ was our representation in the way he was here, but he might have been a representation to the angels in a different way, right? Because that was a different theater of interaction. So, so Christ might have been called an angel of sorts as he interacted with the angels. And so what we can see here is as God works, and when I say God, I mean all three, as God works, he works in different ways, whatever works the best for him. And it has the greatest efficacy. And so they got together and they started talking about how this could happen what they could do to take sinful humanity and give them the opportunity to have life eternal. Because the one thing that God wants is for us to be with him forever and ever. Amen? Amen. And I want that too. Do you want that? Amen. I mean, I want to go to heaven. I, w I want the tears to go away, the pains, the worries, all those things that we uh, suffer from. And so... The very first time that we see God making a move on his plan is actually in the New Testament. And if you would, I'd have you turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. It's going to be hard for you to stay awake tonight. So just hang in there. If you don't, I'm going to come down and throw water on you. <laughs> Luke 
Okay. I might have to um, put my gospel evangelist voice on for a little bit, okay? That'll wake you up. All right? It doesn't mean I'm going to yell at you. But sometimes you just change your, you know, the flow of things a little bit. And so, here we go. We're in chapter 2 of Luke and verse 8. And you're going to ask me, what in the world are we doing talking about Christmas? Well, I can talk about Christmas any time of the year because it's one of my favorite things. All right? Because I, I love to spoil my grandchildren, and I just love the idea of Jesus being born. You know, Sometimes the two don't come together so cool, right? Uh, because we've turned it into a holiday that's not, that we celebrate it differently. But I have always taught my children, this does not have anything to do with the birth of Christ. This has to do with me just loving you and wanting to buy toys that we can play together with. Right? Because... Parents give good gifts to their children. That's a biblical concept, right? Okay. Let's see what's going on here. Now, in verse 8, it says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. This is the same fields that David was watching his flocks in. You know David, right? Remember, he was a shepherd boy. Same field. And they were watching over their flocks by night. And behold... An angel of the Lord stood before them. Now, uh, I come from a pretty humble background in terms of I, you know, I went on to school and I became a dentist, which I think is, you know, I'm not overly impressed with dentistry. But my dad was a garbage man, right? And and so uh, most people think that being a garbage man, well, it's a garbage man. You know what I mean? They they're not really learn it or anything like that, but um, it's not true, by the way. My dad was wealthier than I'll ever be (laughs) because he was a garbage man, but I can remember that what people think about garbage men is this. They think, you know, they're kind of not there, you know. Well, that's how shepherds were. They were the worst people, people in culture, but here we have these shepherds who are in the field, and it's to them that an angel appears, Right? Just think about that. Uh, That the angel appeared to the most humble of those he could find. Now this angel uh, was some angel because he appeared, uh, he was the angel of the Lord, he stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. This is one angel and the glory of the Lord was so amazing that they were afraid. Now, I'll tell you that shepherds don't get afraid. Shepherds, but why? Why don't they get afraid? Especially back then. They had wolves to contend with. You remember uh, some of the other stories that David had? Lions and tigers. I don't know if there were tigers. But those sorts of things, right? They, they didn't have necessarily a fear, but they knew that their job was to protect the flock. So these guys weren't intimidated by much, but when one angel of the Lord shows up and reveals the glory of God, they're sore afraid. Most times in the Bible, when that happens, guess what happens to people? They're flat on their face before the angel. It happens over and over and over again to even people like Daniel, Right? That, that you think, like, well, if, if I could be anything, I would like to be Daniel, you know? He's one of the faithful ones. And so this angel shows up, and he says to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which should be to all people. How many people? Now, this is a message that he's bringing to all people. Now, I want you to notice very carefully the wording of the angel, what the angel says. He says, I bring you, what? Good tidings of great joy. Right? Now, I want you to, what do you think uh, the word tidings means? Good 
What is it? News. It's news. Tidings are news. I bring you good news. Oh, my. What is this angel saying? Because you know what good tidings is? It's in the Greek, it's the word evangelion. And what that Greek word would be was, um, I don't know why my nose runs. It's not that long that it can get ahead of me, you know? But anyway, in the Greek, it's evangelion, which um, has a kind of a special meaning. I think I've shared it with you here before. Evangelion is just a word that when uh, cities were, uh, were having a drought and there was no food, people were about to starve from the f not having food, there would be people that were outposted to look for the ship with the food. And when the food would come, they'd yell out, Evangelion, good news. We're not going to starve. Amen? That's good news. Right? And so the angel says, I got good news for you. And it's not just good news. What else does he say? Of great joy. Right? Now we know that the good news that comes in our understanding as we study the New Testament is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel, gospel literally means good news. Okay? And so this is the first time that the gospel is proposed to humankind and it's to some shepherds. Do you think that heaven's preference would have been that there would have been a lot more people ready to receive the good news. But there weren't. These were the ones who were ready. And I, 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 I can't help but think that before Jesus comes again, there's only going to be a few people who've taken notice of the good news. Sad to say. Don't let that happen. And so, and, and not only good news, but great joy. A lot of times people just, you know, they hear the good noise and the good, good news and they don't have the, the great joy. They suffer under the bondage that they put themselves under. You know, you know what I'm saying? Because, there, because, because there's a true gospel and there's a false gospel, sometimes they get mixed up. The true gospel is salvation by grace in our Lord Jesus Christ. The false gospel is salvation by works. How many times do you find yourself binding yourself down because you think you need to do something to make God happier with you? You need to do something to make God love you more. And we've already demonstrated, right, that God loves you without any reaction from you. Doesn't matter if you're the worst sinner or, you know, whatever, you, he'll chase you down with his love, right? And so there's a song that says, I've never been loved more than I am right now. I've never been loved more than I am right now because God's love is always the same. It's forever and everlasting are you with me so far? Are you with me so far? Yeah. Amen, right? Okay, so this is what's going on with these guys. Now I want you to see the next verse because this is just phenomenal, right? He says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The Savior has come. Can you imagine can you imagine these people who had a whole history of litany that they were waiting for the Messiah, the Savior to come, and here, you know, these, these poor shepherd guys are probably thinking, why are they coming to us? Why aren't they going to the, the, the pastors and the ministers? And, and, you know, that had to be going through their mind. Who is Christ the Lord? And this will be a sign for you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Not quite the, the image they might have had for the Savior of the world, right? 
They probably thought he would come as a great king. Now listen to what it says here. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying. Okay, first off, I want to give you an idea of what we're talking about here. Okay? It says there's a multitude of the heavenly host, right? I don't, mean, I don't know if that means all of the heavenly host or not. But I can take you back to Daniel chapter 7 and I can show you that the heavenly host is thousands of thousands. That, that's about one million. And that it also consists of 10,000 times 10,000. Who can do that math quick? Huh? That's 100 million. Okay, just, just for your sake. Now we had one angel whose glory was so bright it scared the shepherds. And now we have at least 100 million angels on the plain who now the glory of the Lord is on every one of them. It was like, boom! Right? It's like the sun came down and lit up the whole place. And these poor shepherds, these poor shepherds, if they were scared before, they might have had to change their clothes. <laughs> right? This was something else that they were experiencing. And by the way, it had to be seen from a long ways away, right? Now, I want to tell you something. The angels were excited because God had shared with them his intention, his intention to save humanity. And so they were excited to meet whoever it was that they were going to meet to tell them this good story. And so they, you know, they blinked on. They sang their song. This is the song. This is a song. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill towards men. Amen? Amen. By the way, this is the song of the great multitude that Revelation speaks about. It's not the song of the 144,000, but it's the song of the great multitude. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill towards men. Okay, in verse 15, so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went and found Mary, and they found Jesus lying in a manger. I suppose if something like that happened to you or me, we'd remember it the rest of our lives, right? I would remember, certainly remember one angel. Um, but to see a hundred million angels in one place, uh, pretty fascinating. And they were all like, there was nobody. You know, sometimes when we sing in church, it's kind of like, right? You know, you know, sometimes we fake the words, right? We just act like we're singing. We're not really vocalizing, right? right? We're not making a joyful noise unto the Lord because my voice isn't so joyful, right? <laughs> But these angels were in perfect harmony. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace. There hadn't been peace on earth since man had fallen in sin. Goodwill towards men. That was a hard statement to, be, to make because man who found himself in sin, and if you are in sin, you're separated from God. But now God is saying, there's some goodwill coming. Goodwill. Something good is about to happen. Now, this is an interesting thing because we're in Easter week, right? And we're supposed to be talking about Easter, but... Easter couldn't have happened unless this happened, right? So the first thing I want you to make note of is that in Jesus, that at his birth, something special happened. Now, what we need to understand now is 
What kind of birth was it that Jesus had, as you can remember? Was he human? Was he God? Was he some mixture? You know, all my, all my kids have married uh, into ethnic groups, right? Because we're ethnic too. And so we, you know, we, uh, when Alex and, and Brianna got married, Alex is Guatemalan, 100% Guatemalan. And so we're sharing our kind of picturing what kind of children or grandchildren we're gonna have, right? And uh, Erica and Justin, she's Korean. And Emily and Charles, he's African American. And you begin to wonder what kind of kids, what kind of kid was Jesus? Because the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, right? And she conceived a child, right? And so what was Jesus? What do you think he was? It's a hard question, isn't it? I want you to think about it. Because Jesus was 100% human and 100% divine. Well, how do you get 200%? I don't know. I don't know how you do that. But it's true. And so he had all the divine prerogative of the Father. What do I mean by that? He had all the power. He had all those things, right? But by the way, did he use those when he was here on earth? Well, how in the world did he do all those miracles then? What, did he use his own power to do those things? No, and uh, I mean, what, what are we talking about? He was a great carpenter, probably, yeah. But how did he use, how did he heal people? From God, yeah, but be more specific. Who said that? Stand up and do a dance. Yeah, that's, that was, that's good. You don't want to get me started. That's good, sister. You hit a home run. Good job, right? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, it says that the, the seven, basically, I'm going to summarize, the seven spirits of God were upon him. What do you mean, seven spirits? Well, that's a study for another time that, you know, that there's, uh, even Revelation says the seven spirits are before the throne. So the Holy Spirit is divided into seven different notions. That's another sermon I can preach you someday, if you want. I'm doing that online right now. So, okay, so the Holy Spirit was in its fullness on Jesus. Can you think of anybody else who might have had the fullness of the Spirit in their life? Like, as you go through the Old Testament, sometimes it'll say, he had the Spirit of knowledge. Or he had the Spirit of wisdom. Can you think of anybody else who might have had all the same portions of the Spirit as Jesus? This is not fair, but I'll tell you, it was Daniel. Very clearly, as you go through the book, just lays him out, you know, that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. How would you like to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Amen. Amen. How would you like that? It wasn't Jesus doing things in and of himself. So Jesus was, most importantly, he was human. So the first task, and it's important that he was divine as well, but uh, thinking about that brings up all kinds of interesting questions, right? Like, when he died, what happened to the divine side? Right? Because divinity can't die, right? Okay? There's one for you to chew on. Okay? But the fact that he was human meant that he could relate to us in our suffering. You hear what I'm saying? Because was he, did, was he created with a perfectly divine body? No. Otherwise, he wouldn't have aged. He would have lived to be 900 and some years like the, the patriarchs did. He would not suffer from a lot of the things that we, did, we do. He would, um, his body was definitely uh, feeling the, the sin of time 
Are you with me? I'm not saying Jesus was a sinner. I'm just saying he was born in a time where his body was, uh, the flesh was uh, a result of sin. Because by that time, the earth had already been 4,000 years old. And so with time, if you read in the Old Testament, the lives were getting shorter and shorter and shorter. By the time Jesus came in the fullness of time, people were only living to 40 years old. Now, some of that had to do with, you know, babies dying because things weren't good. But that's the truth of it. And so Jesus, you know, after he worked a hard day at the carpenter shop, he probably needed Ben Gay or some other formulation, you know, like you and me. That's not a sin. That's just being human, right? Um, you know, Ben Gay is called the old man's aftershave. <laughs> <laughs> so Jesus, uh, he could relate to us in that way, okay? And so this being human becomes very important. Another reason it becomes important is because now Jesus comes as a human, but undefiled. In other words, he comes and there's no sin there. Okay? So we already have one ancestor in our lineage that sinned, and because he did, we live in sin. Who was that? Adam, right? So Jesus is called the second Adam. Because there was no sin. And then there was the first Adam where there was sin. Now, for now, I just want you to understand that this is, this is our plight right here, right? Up until Jesus. This is our plight, is that because our father, by the way, we can look back and uh, does anybody here do genealogy? Like, do you do, have you researched your family history? Yeah, I've, I've gone all the way back to Ireland and places like that to see my old family history and um, and if I went far enough, guess where I'd end? I'd end it with Adam, right, right? Because uh, we were all in, the, in, 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 in Adam's seed, okay? That, that much we can. It's not what, you know, the scientists of today say. They say, well, we're all from probably some Mongolia somewhere or Africa or something like that. It's not like that. We all came from Adam. If you're a believer and you're a Christian, you believe in the Bible, that's the truth of it, okay? Adam was our first father, Eve was our first mother. But when Jesus came along and he was a human, he gave us an alternative to being in this category. And the alternative was, he said, and this is beautiful, First John tells us this, it says, the alternative is, listen, I can adopt you over here. Wow, thank you, Lillian. I'm about to suffer a fall over. Jesus has volunteered and offered to you to be adopted. You know that when you're adopted, you have all the rights of some of the, the natural born child, right? So now everything that we have in Jesus is over here. Because now he's our father and not Adam. Are you with me so far? Is this just too heavy? I'm going to stop right now because some of you, your eyes are crossing. I just want to make sure that, that, that everybody is with me. Do you have a question? Because I don't want to make this too regimented that we can't ask along the way. Does anybody have a question about that? That, that in Jesus, we've been adopted to a new life, right? That's pretty special, isn't it? Okay, 
Now, I want you to put your thinking caps on, and I want you to think about Jesus and his life, and we're going to put a few other things down here. The reason I started here is because in order to talk about what we're going to talk about the rest of the time, we needed to see that he was actually born in this way. So what else can we put on the board that pertains to Jesus with, in terms of like events that happened in his life? What other things? Lack of conception. Lack of con what? Yeah, right. We'll just right there. Okay, we'll leave it at birth, but it's not it's much more fancy to say immaculate conception. Yeah. I don't even know how I would spell that even if you wanted me to. But anyway, is there anything else that could go in this column? His life? Did he have a life? We're thinking about big things here. Uh, is there anything special about the life of Jesus Christ? Yeah, he did. He was pretty smart, wasn't he? Yeah. I have a grandson like that. He's five years old, and he knows all his times tables already. Right? It's really, really smart. Uh, he was sinless, brother. Praise the Lord. Thank you. He was without sin. Oh, this is getting better all the time, okay? Because if Jesus is our father and he was without sin, that now pertains to us. I'm going to explain that in a little bit, okay? He was without sin. The Bible has multiple passages. I'm not going to give you everything. We'd have to be here until the end of the year, right? If I gave you everything here. Does anybody have a question about that? That Jesus in, never sinned his whole life. I don't even know how that's possible. But it's true. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay, what, what would be the next event in this chain here? His death. Okay. Was there anything significant about the death of Christ? He suffered, but you know what? There have been people, if you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, I don't know why, I've read it several times. There are worse deaths than what Jesus, you know, the physical part of it. So I'm not talking about the physicality. Um, so what else? He rose from the dead. That might be another thing we'll put on there, that he was resurrected, but let's deal with the death first. He died to save us, yes, but was this just any kind of death? Did it, was it just like him falling asleep like my mom did not too long ago? What was this death about? He overcame sin. He died from a broken heart. He died from a broken heart. He overcame sin. He took on the sins of the world. He took on the sins of the world. Thank you. Yes, he did. And he defeated death. And he defeated death. And when he took on the sins of the world and he defeated death, what kind of death did Jesus die? Separation from God, because what did he say on the cross? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He, at least that's how we felt, right? So what kind of death is that? Somebody, somebody, it's on the tip of your tongue. Somebody has it on the tip of their tongue. Do you have it on the tip of your tongue? No? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Huh? Is anybody? Is there only one death? Oh, brother, thank you very much. You're on a roll. When Jesus died, he died the second death. What are you talking about, Jeff? What are you talking about? The second death, is, the term is in the Bible. What does it mean? Well, we know what the first death is, right? It's the death that all men come to, and women too. Although I will tell you, that women are the stronger sex. Because I, I, have, I have many women in my practice who are 90 to 100, and I have one man. It's just something I've observed. 
Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I just say that kind of thing to make the ladies like me. <laughs> okay. What, what is the second death? Okay, it's an eternal what? An eternal what? An eternal separation from what? From God. This is eternal separation from God. My brother Bob was one of the best teachers I ever, I've ever known in my life, and he was uh, uh, was my mentor, and he was also Lillian's mentor. But he could not spell for the life of him, like one of the brightest guys. And I mean, he, if he could do it phonetically, he would. You know what I mean? He just, as it sounded, that's how he put it on the board. And we tried to, we did write a book together. And we tried to write other things together, but half the time I didn't know what he was trying to spell. You know, uh, some people are just like that, right? So brilliant that the, the practical things don't work. Um, but yeah, he Jesus died a death that meant eternal separation from God. Was he eternally separated from God? So how does this work? If you, because this is a this is a question that people have. Anybody have an idea? From the sin. It's a, it, he, he had a, he died a death that was eternal separation from God. Who could change that? God could change that, right? He could change the terms of that on the basis of what. The willingness of Jesus to die an, a, a death that was eternal separation. I mean, Jesus said in the garden, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. I'll do whatever you want me to do, God, in order to save these people. Amen? How are you feeling about that? Huh? You should feel special. Thank you, brother. You should feel special that Jesus made that decision and then God said, hey, that's enough. That's enough. Just his willingness is enough in order for me to save these people. Wow. Now, I want, you to, I want to ask you something, and I don't know the answer to this either. Uh, because, like I said before, is that eternity or, or uh, God's um, being God, he had eternal life within him, the divine part. So when he was in the grave, where'd that go? This, this is amazing to think about. I want you to think about it for a second. Where did it go? the eternal part of Jesus, the divine part of Jesus, the God part of Jesus, right? Because he was still God. His human body died, right? We know that. But where did the God part go? Nope. No evidence of that. Because he said, I have not yet returned to my father in the garden. Yeah, he, uh, it was apparently part of his willingness to go through this was that he would eternally cloak his divinity. What? Are you kidding me? He was willing to eternally cloak his divinity? I mean, it's one thing for him to die as a human, but what he had been through eternity... He was willing. Now, notice I said he was willing. He was willing to do that. Boy, Jesus really, really, really loves you. He 
really does. Are you feeling it in your heart? I want you to know how big this is. How big this is. We're going we're to go into a lot of detail with, when we get to the cross and the thing after. Okay, um, we did the birth, the life, the death. Sister, what did you say was next? Back here, I want to, don't, don't, don't steal her thunder. What did you say? Yes, ma'am, thank you. You got to watch it because if I ask you a question, the vultures start to circle. <laughs> okay, and I just talked about my brother and I don't know how to spell resurrection, so I'm just going to shorten it. Is it two R's or two S's? Resurrection. Resurrection. That's what Easter's all about, right? Is that he was made alive again. How many um, people died in the Bible and were resurrected? Two? Two? I'm checking to see how well you know your Bibles. A lot. A lot? Yeah. Okay, well, you're, count, you're, you're doing that count after the cross, but I'm, I'm talking about individuals. It's a common number for God's kingdom. Seven. Good job. How many in the New Testament? So besides Jesus... There were three in the New Testament and three in the Old Testament. And then Jesus was the main one. Why, why would I ask you about that? I, it, it, I don't even know. But it's a, it's a chiasm. Do you know what a chiasm is? Never mind. We'll talk about it another time. <laughs> Lillian's like, don't. <laughs> okay. okay. Tell me about the resurrection of Jesus. Was it foretold? Yes, it was, wasn't it? Yes, was. Did it happen exactly as it was said it would? Yes. yes, it did. By the way, if you do a forensic, and you know what forensics is, if you do a forensic analysis of the prophecies of the Old Testament, the idea or the impossibility of all those things pointing to one person is phenomenal. It would be like, um, I forget how deep it was, but somebody said you could put coins on the whole state of Texas, and it would be feet, uh, feet thick, and you'd have to pull one coin out, and it would be the right one for all those things to point to Jesus. Are you with me now? The odds of one person fulfilling all of the prophecies in the Bible were extreme, and yet it happened in Jesus Christ. Thank you for saying amen. <laughs> I like it when you say amen because I know you're still awake. Okay. Okay. Okay, resurrection. Can you point to any, any other event in the life of Christ that can go down here at the bottom? Ascension. What'd you say? Ascension. Ascension. Thank you. Boy, you get an A there today. I don't know if I'm spelling this one right either. I shouldn't have talked about my... I shouldn't talk about my brother. That's what happens. All right. His ascension. Now, in the New Testament, um, the Old Testament pointed to all these things quite frequently. The New Testament, when the disciples went out, this was the main thing that they talked about. And this one here, we hardly ever talk about, the ascension. But it's incredibly important. Okay, so now we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. So get your Bibles out because we're going to... Am I still... I'm going to go a little bit longer tonight. Is that okay? Are you all, is everybody okay? Okay. You can just, at any time, you can just say, Jeff, stop. Ephesians chapter 2.
Okay, here we go. Ephesians chapter 2, right from verse 1. And you were made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Amen? 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 Amen. You were uh, made alive. What does that mean? That means I was spiritually dead because of my sin, and I was made alive. Do you feel alive tonight? Has Christ made you alive from your trespasses and sin? Amen. This is for us. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. The trespasses and sins were in, were in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2. Okay? Is everybody with me? I'm sorry, I, I went hastily. In which you once walked according to the course of the world. What, what did you do? You walked in your trespasses and sins according to the course of the world. The world is all about trespasses and sins. We talked about that a couple of nights ago. Just look around, look at all the, the terrible things that are happening that people do to each other. Uh, and we realize that man is still finds himself under sin according to the course of this world. This is the world's way according to the prince of the power of the air. Who's the prince of the power of the air? It's none other than Satan himself. Okay, so the world is following after Satan and doing what he tempts them to do. And and he is the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Okay, so it's a pretty, uh, pretty lively description when it says, and you he made alive who once were doing this. Aren't you glad that you're no longer under the world? Aren't you glad about that? It's terrible what the world does. You know what? I look around and of course there's the saying is, I I look at what's going on in places like uh, Ukraine, I'm horrified. But I also know, because that's the course of the world, but for the grace of God, that could be me. You know, I've certainly gotten mad enough at times in my life. I confess that before the Lord. But what I want you to know, that that's no longer the hammer that keeps you down. Because he made you alive. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 3. Among whom also we all, all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? There was a time when we were living according to the course of this world that we were all subject to the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. How many of you know what the last temptation is before we go into heaven? Anybody know? We can look at the children of Israel and we can understand this a little bit more and we can look at prophetic literature. And the last thing that happened to them before they went into uh, the promised land is they were tempted by the local women who weren't God's children. Now, I'm not, I'm not coming down on the Israelites. I'm just saying that the last temptation before we enter the promised land or heaven is going to be the loss of the flesh. That has its look everywhere. 70% of the internet is, is pornography. Are you with me? I'm not going to go there anymore. Okay, verse 4. But God, I love this phrase. It's one of my favorite phrases in the Bible. Paul uses it often. He uses this, this, uh, he's about to set things straight. And we just heard something terrible, right? And, And now he uses those two little words, but God. Amen? I love that. 
But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us. We just found that out this weekend, didn't we, as we're talking. Because of that great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Oh, that's, that's worth an amen. That's worth a hallelujah. Hallelujah. By grace we have been saved, even though we found ourselves in the flesh. Even when we were dead in our trespasses. Well, we read that this morning, right? In Romans chapter 5, we found out that uh, Christ loved us uh, before we changed, right? That he gave up his life for us before we changed. That he loved us when we were enemies of his. All of those things that we talked about this morning, that God acted towards us before we knew, even knew he existed in our lives. We were, we were so consumed by being in the world and the, the lust of the flesh. And listen to what it says then. It said, and he raised us up together and made us, uh, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. By the way, that, that fits right here, doesn't it? I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, but that he raised us up and we sit together with Jesus in heavenly places. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Amen, right? Okay, I want to, I want to do something now. And... I want you to understand this because this, this is the hard part to understand, okay? What, first off, I'm going to ask you a question, and um, the question I want to ask is, how much did you contribute to anything in this column? I want everybody to say it. What did you contribute? Nothing. Zero. You have contributed zero to everything that Christ has done here. His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And yet, because of these things, by grace, we have been saved. This is the good news of the gospel. I'm not just saying that's all of the gospel. I'm just saying this is the good news of the gospel. So if I'm over here now in Adam... How do I get access to this? Because I want those things in my history. Let me explain that to you, okay? Right now, our history is based on our, re our relationship to Adam and his sin, okay? And so we're, we find ourselves in a predicament because no matter how hard I try to get better, right, in my own life, I keep falling to the flesh, I keep sinning, I keep, because the, this is the way of man is sin, okay? But now I've been renewed in Jesus Christ and I've been adopted as his son, so guess what happens? Because I believe that that's true and that's the only thing that is necessary, it's the truth that saves you because I believe that it's true that Jesus Christ has done all of this on my behalf, this here now becomes my history. Amen. Are you with me? I, I, I mean, I, I hope you didn't miss that. All of these things that Christ has done, answering all the questions of sin, now becomes my history. Amen. Right? I don't have to get up there before the throne of God and say, have him say, well, Jeff... You know, this is your life. I don't have to be embarrassed. I don't have to be sorrowful because I know what a mess my life has been. How about you? 
It's been, if you're honest with yourself, you're going to see that you've been living according to the world. And if there's a book out there, and there is, that records everything you've ever done, would you, I wouldn't even want to read about myself in that book, would you? No? I mean, because what do I do about my own sin? I lie about it to myself. I say, well, that's not so bad. Right? We take a measurement. And we say, ah, I'm pretty good. Even when people die in the world, they say, ah, I think he'll be in heaven. He was pretty good. By what standard? Their, Their standard, right? It's a personal morality thing that people take on instead of the compass being Jesus Christ. Are you with me? So now, because this, all of this is leading to something that's coming up, and that's the second coming of Jesus in the judgment, right, which is in the Bible. When I go to the judgment day, I don't have to fear. Amen? Amen. Because, first off, perfect love casts out fear, but also because now when God looks at me, he says, oh, it's my son. It's my son. It's Jesus. I'm thrilled about that. Are you thrilled about that? Come on, say yes. Say it. God has said, I will let my son be your substitute. And then he says, welcome home. Welcome home. Spend eternity with me and Jesus. This is a little bit more theological, and I I hope you're seeing it. This is what we call the objective gospel. It's only objective because uh, objective means I had nothing to do with it, okay? And the only thing I had to do with anything or the subjective part of the gospel here is I said yes to Jesus. Jesus does it all. All to him I owe. Right? I hope you're seeing this tonight. It's the most wonderful truth that has ever come to the universe. Okay. I want to... By the way, this is my favorite thing in the world. It's to study this stuff. I love to go... You know what what we're going to do with this? We're going to study it through eternity, mm-hmm. right? If, we st- if, we're, if we're going to study it through eternity, how much do you think we know? Yeah. Not, not very much yet, right? Yeah. Enough, but not very much. We're going to study this through eternity, and guess who's going to be the teacher? Jesus, Jesus Christ himself. I can't wait. I can't wait. I want to lay my pen down. But until then, I'll teach what I know. And I want you to know the same thing. Thank you for being patient tonight. I needed to get all of this out so that you have a full understanding. This now taught, lets us go into the rest of the week, doesn't it? Because we got to think about the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. These are all part of basic parts of the subjective gospel that we need to really know for ourselves. But you don't, you know, it's, it's much simpler than that. It's simple enough to say, do you believe that Jesus did what he said he would do? And you say, yes, I did. Yes, I do. And in a moment, in a moment, you've stepped into something, and and Paul says it like this. When you say yes to Jesus, the first thing that comes to you is peace, and it's peace with God. Amen? Amen? The next thing that comes is you get to stand in grace. I think of that like, you know, like a swimming pool. I stand in that swimming pool and it's called grace. You know what that means? I can make a mistake and God is forgiving. Okay? And then the next thing he says is we're going to rejoice in the glory of God. In other words, God is going to start to dress me up and change who I am and make me look like his son. Right? That's another part of the good news. 
Tonight, though, I want you to know that you can simply trust in Jesus. And it's taken care of. Amen? Amen. Okay. Before I go to this last thing, does anybody have any questions? I don't want to leave this. It's too important not to answer questions. Okay. Get your little card out. I'm sorry, what? No, seven, seven um, spirits. There's seven, yeah. I'll show it to you. Come afterwards, I'll show you, give you some text, okay? There's one spirit, but seven directives. Uh, it goes like this, the spirit of God, the spirit of love, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of like that. So if you read, uh, if you're doing uh, like a, a survey of the Old Testament, you'll see that it was given to certain individuals. They were given one aspect of it. But we have the opportunity to have all of it. All of it. Okay, so I want you to put your name down, your telephone, your date, your address, and I'll be coming over for supper sometime, if you'll do that. <laughs> and uh, number one, uh, would you like to have uh, more Bible study in your life? Would you like somebody to study the Bible with you? Uh, number two. What was number two? Oh, she just said slow down. It's 1.30. I mean, 8.30. I got to hurry up. What was number two? I forget. Huh? Oh, oh, I don't know. I forgot. If you want to be baptized, check number two. Or if you want to be rebaptized, check number three. Number four. Hmm. If you oh, if you want to visit, if you want to have a visit, I'll even come if there's food. <laughs> <laughs> and number five, if you would like to have uh, participate in the healing service, check number five. Uh, for that one, please write down what it is that you'd like for us to be praying about, and uh, whether it's just a brokenness in your heart, or it's a physical ailment, or if it's like you feel like you're double-minded, or like, you know, you, you feel like you can't quite keep your mind in Christ. Uh, that's very important because that's what that chapter in, in uh, James uh, is about, is mostly about double-mindedness, but it applies to the rest. And I'll be asking you to help me with that as well. Okay, did you get all that, everybody? Yep. And we don't do these things to pester you or to make you feel uncomfortable. We do these things because we're ministers of the gospel who are selected and asked to help God's people. So I would, I, I feel negligent if I didn't at least give you a chance to say yes something okay is that fair enough these you I, I remember when I was a youth these things were so uncomfortable they really were I mean you feel like you know that guy up there is trying to sell me a car right? I'm not trying to do that I love Jesus so much that I can't wait for you to know him like I do and maybe you know him even better than me but there's so much that we can learn together about our Lord and Savior yet Okay, that being said, uh, just give those cards to one of the gentlemen in the back as you leave, and let's pray. By the way, um, I didn't make you hug anybody tonight, but you can do that as we leave, okay? Tell them how much you love them and how much God loves them. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that the word of God is is made so that we can understand it. And we're, we're so thankful tonight to see the gospel, the good news. If there were angels uh, appearing to us today, they would be shouting and singing the glory of what Christ has done. I pray that that song will be in each person's heart. Lord, wake us up. Make us aware of the time we live in so that these things become the main things and help us to keep the main thing the main thing. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for being patient tonight. I went long. I appreciate it.